Hey, sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown and the podcast. If you're listening to this on YouTube, don't forget you can click over and listen to the complete podcast over on iTunes or Stitcher or anywhere else you want to go. And I'm pleased to bring on the show Miles Brown, who currently contributes to GQ on the NBA beat. And uh, but if you look at his uh, Twitter account, I mean his his basic bio is simply nah. <laughs> so Miles, thanks for coming on the show and joining us and talking a little bit about uh, whatever we're going to talk about today. Thanks for having me. Um, now you are a little bit mysterious. I think even part of your you know your bio on Twitter kind of shows that. Uh, and I just thought we could start by talking about when I first became aware of you and your account, because that's sort of where I, I didn't see the writing as much as where I saw it on Twitter. Um, when did you start getting onto Twitter actively? Um, that's a good question. I'd say, what is it, 2015? Uh-huh. Probably about six, seven years ago now. It, it was somewhere around, like, I want to say, 08, 09. Okay. And I, I don't think Twitter started much before that anyway, probably like around 2007, maybe? Yeah, I'm not sure. It was... Uh, it was there in like 2006, 2007, I want to say, but it wasn't as active as, like people hadn't really found it or taken it seriously. Right. So as I do a quick search, it says March of 2006 is when it actually like first became active or uh, sentient, whatever you want to call that. Uh, so you're out there. Uh, did you get what Twitter was originally in the, when in, in the beginning? Uh, I didn't get it in the very beginning. That's why I, I'm late to the game. I didn't start tweeting until maybe like 2011, 2012. Did you get it right away? Um, for the purposes that I generally use it for, yeah. Just because back then it was still heavy blog times for uh, a lot of NBA stuff. There was still your free Darkos. There was your uh, probably your blowtorch. Um a bunch of other sites, straight banging. And I was really active in the slam comments. And then when things just kind of transferred over to Twitter, it just was a continuation of that, of just finding people that you appreciated their perspective on things and asking them questions and then getting to know each other, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it, uh, it, it pretty much wrote itself. Mm-hmm. We're all watching a game. We're all sharing something together. We all just start talking about whatever comes to mind. Yeah, I think that's what I, w- I kind of didn't follow uh, for a while was that it basically became a conversation on the NBA 24-7 across the entire world. And who doesn't want to do that, right? Like that, that when I finally figured that out, uh, you know, to the detriment of my marriage to some degree, <laughs> um, <laughs> It was a really exciting thing. I, you know, it's funny. I'm, we're kind of lucky because, at least in the YouTube comments of all of our videos, I, I almost never have an issue with that, uh, with having, you know, comments that aren't germane or just, or just uh, hostile. Um, I don't know exactly if it's the nature of the, of the content that sort of attracts uh, people that don't want to do that or, or not. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, and I've always felt lucky that way because, yeah, I get it, you know. Some of the people on ESPN would say, yeah, it's all dick jokes and, uh, and, and you know, screaming at people and, and making really horrible comments about different races and, and, um, and walks of life. Uh, but for some reason, I've been able to, I guess we've been able to avoid that. Um, and, uh, and, it's inter- and I think that's the key. I think that's what we're seeing going forward. I think everyone's going to want to have that kind of voice to weigh in on with their opinion, uh, no matter, you know, who that is and who they're talking to. Yeah, I mean, personally, I've really leaned back on a lot of that just because I I don't feel like, you know, I'm being, like, snooty about anything, but I just choose to respond to people who say something that actually evokes a response from me. You know, it's not as though I will respond to everybody who says something to me because everything isn't worth replying to, and sometimes there's just nothing to say. You know, it's like, all right, mm-hmm. you said that. And I hear you, but I'm going to keep going on about my day because you don't want to get caught in a trap where people <laughs> feel like you owe them something, you know? Yeah, that is true. That is true. And so what, what kind of captured your imagination about the NBA that led you to want to write about it? Um, honestly, I hadn't really considered it until I was given the opportunity. Well, I mean, probably shortly before, but... um. I grew up in Chicago. I grew up on Michael Jordan. And obviously that means reading a lot about Michael Jordan. 
And then when I went to uh, military school, I was right down the road from uh, Kobe Bryant when he was in high school. So I read a lot about Kobe Bryant. And I remember learning about just different players through Sports Illustrated or the local paper or whatever you know the medium was during those times, whether you're talking about an Allen Iverson or you know a Jason Kidd or whoever. So just you, you ingest enough of those stories where you start to imagine yourself telling them. Okay. Uh, now, did you, did you do writing in college? No. No, not really. Um, well, I don't remember taking a creative writing course at all, actually. Huh. That's okay. That's unconventional, I suppose. Um, so I'm kind of curious. You, you, didn't, you hadn't really written about it until you got the opportunity to write about it. So is this one of those, like, Internet success stories where, you know, the new – the new uh, millennium allows that kind of thing to sprout and grow? Pretty much. I mean, it just goes back to, I think, those comments sections in Slam where you were allowed to interact with each other so much that I feel like they developed an appreciation for what I had to offer. And they gave me an opportunity to have my own blog. And I jumped at it, but I didn't even know that it came with a press pass just because of Slam being the, uh, the entity that it was. And that allowed me to really get a lot of experience that I wouldn't have otherwise, probably at any other place. Wow. So it, it was just a matter of the right place at the right time. And so and you're in New York at this point, right? No, I was in uh, Minneapolis. Ah, so the press pass for you would have been for the Timberwolves games? Yeah. And so you're going, were you going to the games and really utilizing it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I went to, I mean, if there's 41 home games, I would imagine I was at at least 30 of them. Oh, cool. And so were you trying to do, uh, like, get, get one-on-ones, or were you just kind of scrums? How, what kind of uh, experience were you getting from that? Well, it was a really bad team. I mean, like, as bad as the Wolves have been historically, that was probably rock bottom. So what, what was, year are we talking about? Uh, 08. It was right after KG left, that very first year. Okay. <clears throat> and I was there all the way until probably about 2012. So we're talking like Rashad McCants, Al Jefferson, Ryan Gomes. Uh, uh, the guy, uh, was the guy from the Clippers? Uh, Gerald Green was there. Uh, um, what? There's a, there was a foreign player from the Clippers, uh, a guard, a big guard. Uh, Oh my goodness! I'll come up with his name in a minute. But anyway, it might have been just before that. But anyway, um, yeah. So, so you're dealing with that. So, does that mean that you're getting easier access because there's less scrutiny? Definitely. It was probably the best place for me to be in terms of getting my feet wet and just learning things. Because you walk in that locker room, there's nobody in there, mm -hmm. and unless there's a big team in town, you know, unless you're your Kobe Bryant or your LeBron James is there, there's nobody in the visitors' locker room either. So I pretty much, you know, amongst about, <clears throat> excuse me, about uh, 10 or 12 people had free run of the place. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's a good experience. I was going to say, was, it, was Marco Yarich there when you were <laughs> been there? Coming uh, I want to say yeah, but I could be wrong. Yeah, he, I, I just, his it was last year was 07, 08, so that might have been, it sounded like, were you 08, 09? Um, Whichever year was the first year after KG left. I want to say 07, 08. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm looking right now. Uh, it looks like oh, uh, KG was gone by then. Yeah, so that must have been there too. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of rough. And the coach at that point was, uh, with, oh, you know, I forgot. It was Randy Whitman. Yeah, he was, uh, he was an interesting guy. How so? <laughs> um, I, I don't think he was the right guy to coach a young team, at least of that limited talent because he had such I mean like I honestly don't keep up with him on a day-to-day -day basis now so I don't know if he's mellowed out or all but um he was just so angry all the time just so frustrated just a total taskmaster just browbeating everybody and no matter how hard he did it it wasn't going to work so I almost felt sorry for him but ultimately I just felt like he was the wrong guy for that job that's interesting. You know, I wonder, we, we have to try and find that out if he's mellowed or not. Um, you know where he played college, right? Uh, Indiana for Bobby Knight, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, that's where I remember thinking he got it from. Okay, so it, it definitely resembled that uh, if, on the outside, looking at him, like facial expressions, the whole, the whole intensity. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, total scowl, total just gruff demeanor. And I get it. I mean, you're coaching a very bad basketball team, and you're probably just frustrated with the entire process. So I understand, but it still was what it was. Right. Um, I mean, I think it doesn't matter what kind of team you have. It does feel like in this day and age, um, being that kind of coach with the PJ Carlissimo or you know the Screamer Yelder kind of thing doesn't really fly no matter what you do, right? Uh, I don't think guys respond to that. I mean, there are obviously very good players or even mediocre players who enjoy being challenged. But on a day-to-day basis, I don't think that you can sustain any kind of team success if you're constantly, you know, you you got your foot on the neck of your players all the time. <laughs> what, what what are you uh, what are you building towards? Do you want to try and you know? continue writing on the NBA and, and, and make that blow up even more? Or are you, are you, are you, do you have the, the uh, wandering eye for some other kind of subject? What do you think? Um, I honestly don't know right now. I mean, if I'm being truthful about everything, just because I've also been doing a lot of uh, copywriting over the past few years. And that's really opened me up to some experiences that I wouldn't have had otherwise that allowed me to do what I do in a way that is completely different from what I was doing. And that's just in terms of digital spots or writing commercials or, you know, just doing straight copy for your brick and mortar stores and just imbibing in a different aspect of basketball culture than what I had been doing before. And I enjoy writing and given the right opportunities, I would continue to pursue it. But it's just a matter of what's available and what's appealing to me at the time. And right now, I'm currently making those decisions. Uh, can you give us an example of a, of a commercial that you wrote? Um, I did a digital spot for uh, Kyrie Irving. It was for his shoe, the uh, Kyrie One. There was, I think it, um, I think it was LeBron, Kobe, Kevin Durant, Scottie Pippen, Gary Payton, Penny Hardaway, and I could be missing somebody, but the, uh, the concept was all of those guys just talking about the feeling of pride and amazement of having their own first signature shoe and then welcoming Kyrie into that, that rare club. Yes, that is very cool. Now, that was a digital, so we find that online all over the place. Yeah, I'd assume so. Um, now that what's interesting about that is because oftentimes there's no cre- credits. No one ever gets to find out who does all that stuff, basically, right? I mean, you you kind of are in the shadows. Yeah, I mean, it's because you're working for an agency first and foremost, who is working on behalf of the brand. So, at the end of the day, all glory goes to the brand. I mean, you have your agencies that have built up such a reputation that they make the brand. In the case of a Wyden and Kennedy. But uh, what I was doing was more of a smaller scale team effort where it's hard to put credit on anything just because so many people contribute to a process, whether it's the producer who's actually corralling all of the assets or, you know, the manager who's maintaining the, uh, the relationship with the client to the creatives who are putting together the, the visuals or the copywriter myself who's putting together the words or the concepts. So... Yeah, you're never going to see, you know, just like one big name on something like you would like a movie. Right, right. Well, uh, you know, again, I, I guess what's cool about that as well is that they're, they're usually kind of short. You can get in, get out. You get, you get the gratification of seeing the, the, the product right away as opposed to like a movie where it could take years before you get the chance to see it. Yeah, I mean, it's still a fairly intensive process if you're, you're talking about uh, – spots or commercials or what have you just because those things have to go through so many rounds of ideation and approval and there's Mm -hmm. a lot of there's a lot of bureaucracy when you're dealing with a with an entity as big as a nike or any other brand of that stature where it's not a matter of one two three it's more like one one point one one point two back to one point one so on and so forth 
Yeah, and it's, and it's creatively frustrating, I have to imagine. Certainly, I know on my end, when I'm trying to get these things done on my show, like, you know, to get Nike or whoever to, to do some integrations, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable how long and how, how much you have to go through to get to anybody that can make a decision. I think it's a matter of there just being so many different decision makers because when, when you're talking about something that big, then there are people who are in charge of social. There are people who are in charge of digital. There are sports marketing representatives who are in charge of uh, fulfilling the needs and the desires and requests of the athlete. There are you know your big brand representatives. There's your North American. There's your global where it's – not exactly a case of too many chiefs and not enough Indians. It's more that there's just so many different aspects to maintaining a, a brand that big that everyone has to be on the same page and that doesn't always make the process easy. Right. Well, you made the process easy on this podcast by presenting some fantastic stuff and interesting uh, stories and how your process works. Uh, I thank you for coming on the show. We, you know, Definitely you should come on again and we'll, we'll find some more cool stuff to talk about. Cool. Thanks for having me. I had a good time. You got it. And then, hey, maybe maybe one day we'll, you'll do a commercial for B-Ball Breakdown. As <laughs> long as you're paying, yeah. <laughs> well, that we can talk uh, about off the air. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us. And don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel. We're a conversation. You in? You in, Miles? I'm in. <laughs>